please welcome Nicole Contaxis, Justin Delacruz, uh, Peace Awesome William, I think maybe is not with us, and um, Awesome Williamson and Elizabeth Roth, all from the National Network of Library of Medicine and uh, Associated Network of the National Library of Medicine and Associated Regional Medical Libraries for top five tips for pre preparing the NIH DMSP. Uh, thanks, Nina, and thanks for getting out that terrible tongue twister of our affiliations. Um, I am Nicole Contaxis, um, and with me today, as Nina said, is Justin De La Cruz and Elizabeth Roth. We're going to be going through top five tips for preparing for the NIH data management and sharing policy, and regretfully, Peace cannot be here today, but she is, all of her advice is built into our slides. So let's start off. Next slide, please, Justin. I want to give the quickest overview, maybe the quickest of all time, overview of the NIH policy. This policy goes into effect January 25th, 2023. It requires that all NIH grants that will generate scientific data, so that's the majority of grants, um, include a data management and sharing plan with their uh, application. So if you in the audience have worked on NSF grants before, maybe this is a little familiar to you, but a data management and sharing plan outlines how the researcher is going to, as you might guess, manage and share their data over the point of, over the period of the grant. Um, the NIH version of the policy has a few required areas that the plan needs to cover. Um, these include uh, data types, tools and code data standards, preservation access and distribution guidelines, uh, reuse and oversight and compliance policies. Uh, it, it really emphasizes the importance of good data management, and it really pushes forward the idea that NIH data needs to be shared more often than not within the limitations of uh, ethics and the law. Next slide, please. All right, so our tip number one is to understand the policy. Uh, I know this might seem a little simplistic, but I've been working hard on getting my institution compliant for this policy for over a year now. And I think I still sometimes surprise myself with something I misunderstood or somehow overlooked. Um, so next slide. There are happily many resources to help you figure out what the policy is actually about. Um, some of us, myself included, might not excel in reading policy-specific language. It is a very specific way of talking. It's a specific way of writing. So the NIH has pulled together this website, sharing.nih.gov, which goes through things both in the policy language and in plain language. Uh, and I'd really suggest going through this website because the NIH has really pulled together some great resources to help you understand the policy and things that might be outside of your comfort zone, like just-in-time submissions, which was certainly out of my comfort zone when we started. Next slide, please. Oh. Um, and I also just want to highlight, actually, Justin, you can talk about this, but there are some upcoming services to help you better understand the policy outside of those websites. Justin? Yes. So if you check on nnlm.gov, you'll see all upcoming classes. And we at the National Center for Data Services, uh, we're developing uh, sessions, informational sessions on the data management and sharing plan, um, including short sessions and a longer immersion session. Um, so this particular session will be a day long uh, look at research data management and also the specific ins and outs of the policy um, that we want to highlight for uh, librarians, especially working with researchers to comply. So it will include a uh, description of different parts of the policy, um, the things we mostly look at and are worried about uh, in our work, and um, just helping people understand what the requirements are and how to be compliant with that. And it's really important because it's tied to funding and uh, it's a necessary component now. So, um, this is designed to take you from zero to 60. Basically, you don't have to have any background knowledge. You'll learn about research data management uh, and the concepts there, and then also about the specifics of the policy. Great. Thanks, Justin. Uh, and I just want to add that if you've worked on things like the NIH genomic data sharing policy before or are subject to other data sharing requirements from the NIH, 
both the NIH site and the various NCDS uh, resources will help you figure out how those different policies interact, because that has been an area of confusion uh, over this past year. So now we get to tip number two, which is to communicate with leadership. Um, generally speaking, it's important to talk to your leadership in order for them to A, understand why this is important for them to know about, but B, to also advocate for yourself and the resources you need in order to support this policy. We'll talk a little bit more about resources later on in the presentation, uh, but I really just wanna highlight that communicating with leadership isn't just about telling them that the policy is important, but also about advocating for yourself and for your needs. Um, and when we say leadership, we really do mean both library and institutional leadership as is appropriate for your institution. I know that many institutions are structured quite differently. There are a lot of different personalities in leadership. There's a lot of different protocols that people use. So as you try to figure out how to talk to your leadership about this policy, it's important to still uh, keep in touch with those things you already know, like uh, does your library director expect you to go through them all of the time? Does your library director not want to be bothered? These sorts of things that you probably know the best as a person who's been working at your institution. Uh, and you'll also want to work with leadership when it comes to outreach plans. Um, they will have the most connections to their uh, to their different departments and groups. Um, so being able to lean on leadership for advice as you figure out things like outreach and training will also be very helpful. Next slide, please. All right, so I'm gonna hand this off to Elizabeth, who's gonna give an example of her work communicating with leadership about the policy. Elizabeth? Thanks, Nicole. So back in August, I went to a researcher mixer that was held after hours uh, to try to advance research discoveries within our institution at the Medical University of South Carolina. And um, each person was invited to do a quick elevator pitch about what they're working on. And so I thought this is a great opportunity to have an audience of researchers. Let me share that part of my work with the Regional Medical Library is to bring attention to the NIH policy that's coming into play. And after that, I was approached by a number of different researchers, and one of which was the Department, um, the Office of Research Development. And they said, we have been trying to wrap our heads around this policy. Can we partner together and do some um, education for researchers? Can you help us get up to speed? So that put in place um, a meeting that we had last month. And then I'll talk about um, in a few slides what we are putting together. Great, thanks, Elizabeth. Um, and I wanna make sure we get through all the tips so I won't go through my example, but suffice to say, it's very similar to Elizabeth's where it's about meeting people in other departments and making sure that they are all aware of this policy and collaborating with them moving forward. Uh, next slide, please, Justin. Okay, tip number three, reuse tools and resources. So we are all lucky enough that there are many engaged uh, librarians and other people in this field who have been building out tools and resources for you to use. Um, I reuse everything that I can get my hands on because I don't like to do work twice. Um, and there's really no reason to reinvent the wheel, especially as we're trying to get our research communities prepared for this. Um, so while I would suggest that you look at your professional organizations and the various listservs that you are on, we're going to take a second to highlight some of the tools and resources that you may want to reuse at your own institution. Next slide, please. All right, and I'm going to hand this off to Justin to talk about more NCDS uh, resources. Thank you. So uh, at the National Center for Data Services, uh, we started a series of webinars um, in early 2022 uh, that introduced the policy, did an overview, and then also had uh, people working at libraries across the country talk about their different approaches uh, to topics on uh, preparing their campus for complying with the policy. So internal outreach and policy and talking about how to update people on that. Um, thinking about educating and how you might talk to other librarians versus researchers versus other people in your community about the different topics, uh, building up infrastructure and, and making connections. And then there was also a policy recap from um, NIH staff on this uh, topic. So you can find all of these on our website. 
and it is packaged as an on-demand course. So you can go through and uh, review the webinars at your own pace. And they're available for uh, continuing education credits for the Medical Library Association. Um, but they're free to anyone and uh, you don't need to apply for those credits if you don't need them. Uh, and they're a really great way to uh, get an introduction to the policy and to hear from different people uh, who've been working in this area for a while. Great, thank you, Justin. Um, next slide, please. All right, and so I think many of you are probably aware of DMP tool. Uh, I just want to highlight that as a fabulous resource to rely on as you try to prepare your own research community. Um, and I want to highlight something I've done as an example, which is, you know, DMP tool with all the librarians and folks behind it have put forward some guidance for the NIH policy. Um, and I basically copied that wholesale, added some NYU Langone specific information uh, where I do a lot of my work, uh, information like where they can talk to uh, our IT group, things of that nature. Um, so I was able to personalize it and really build off of the work that my community has already done. Um, and the next slide, please. Uh, and this outlines a few more um, the NCDS resources that are coming up. Justin, do you want to take us through it quick? Sure. So we have a couple of groups that we work with, including members of RDAP and the MLA uh, Data Caucus. And so we are preparing basically a toolkit for others to use, uh, including example data, uh, data management plans that people can review uh, and see how they, they work with the policy and other kinds of materials for just finding out more about um, data repositories, where to share data, um, scripts and things to use for education purposes and all that kind of stuff. So um, like I said before, check out our website and uh, sign up for updates to see when that stuff is coming out. We're basically rolling it out now until the policy hits in January. Great, thank you, Justin. Next slide. We are on tip number four, collaborate with your communities. Um, so this means, you know, talking to your leadership at your own institution to work with your communities there, as well as reusing many of the tools that your library community is using um, and has created. Um, and it's not just a question of reusing, but also it is assisting in creating new tools and new materials um, as you gain expertise in this area as well. So I want to throw it back to Elizabeth uh, on the next slide for her to talk a little bit more about the seminar she built uh, at her institution. So here's a screenshot of the seminar that we are going to run next month. And it was great because the Office of Research Development took care of registration, the marketing, um, basically just made for me a template that I could fill in with the content. And um, that to me is a great example of collaborating in that we're bringing both of our resources together and it really um, just kind of fell into place. Three minute warning. Great, thanks, Ina. Um, and with that, we'll go to the next slide. Here's our last tip. And I think it's maybe the most important, which is to be realistic. Um, I know at my institution, there are a lot of people looking to the library to sort of fix all of the problems that this policy is going to bring forward. Uh, but it's important to keep in mind what your capacity is uh, and to not try to extend past your capacity uh, for this for other people. Um, so effectively, just don't light yourself on fire to keep yourself to keep others warm. You're going to want to protect yourself as you help others comply with this policy. And you're also going to want to think long term. Uh, maybe you can do individual consults and teaching uh, for a month, but can you do that for a year? So being really realistic about what you need um, and what you're able to provide. So next slide, please. Uh, example here. OK, we have Elizabeth again. Do you want to talk a little bit about where you've drawn some boundaries? Yes. Yeah, so one of the. Um asks that the ORD made of me was, can you clarify in your bio what your uh, relationship is to this at our university? And I made sure to not say, oh, I will do one-on-one -on -one help, or I will, uh, you can call me anytime. I said, you know what, I help direct people to resources, like a lot of the ones mentioned before um, in my NNML, NNLM role. 
And also within the other library teammates, I can be um, a resource to them, but I do not have the capacity to do one-on-one -on -one assistance. Uh, and similarly at NYU Langone, we don't have the capacity to provide individual feedback on data management and sharing plans. And I've been very clear with our leadership that that is not a service we can provide, but we're happy to teach classes. We're happy to point to resources. Um, and if they want individual feedback eventually, um, they can provide us with more support so that we can start to really build out those services. Okay, next slide, please. So here are our conclusions, which is, where do you go from here? Um, and to, in order to decide what your strategy is in addressing this policy, there's three really important things to remember. The first is that you are not alone, that there are resources and there are communities trying to address these issues, and you should work with those communities and leverage the work they've already done, um, which means considering their existing resources uh, and considering their expertise and relying on them to help you build up uh, the services you will need at your institution. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, is to always set boundaries with your leadership and be very clear, as Elizabeth has demonstrated, with what you can and cannot do, considering the capacity that you have. And hopefully, moving forward, what that means is if more work is needed, that you can eventually expand your capacity. Um, but you can't expand your capacity if you are overworked trying to give assessment of each individual DMSP. Um, so that is it from us. Um, thank you so much for listening, and we're happy to take some questions. Thank you very much. Uh, perhaps the the mo I'm going to let people go ahead and capture this with the QR code. Uh, perhaps the most loved, uh, or at least the most recent, was that don't light yourself on fire to keep others warm is very appropriate to uh, all of our experiences and to data librarianship generally. Uh, we had a question of whether the slides um, had updates or needed updates. It looks like they were just slightly, re very slightly rearranged, and uh, so that's cool. But just on the off chance that there was change that we did not catch, uh, if there is, could you give us an update? Uh, for the OSF. Yes, we will share that data slides. Great. We are waiting for um, Q&A. If people have already had conversations on their campuses about NIH and want to uh, share their questions, this is definitely the time. I'll go ahead and ask, I heard I heard Office of Research fly past a few, at, at one point. Can I ask, um, how did that relationship start and develop? Um, so at MUSC, that was me just going to this sort of event um, to network. And someone from that office was there. And since I was talking about the policy, she approached me and said, I... I'm trying to understand this. Can you help me? Can you help our office? And so that set off the relationship. And just to add to what Elizabeth has said, I similarly, it's about going to events, uh, which has been a challenge uh, post COVID, but going to events and meeting people to discuss uh, what you're there to do and how you can work with them. So it's a, a bunch of networking uh, also at the NYU end. Great, thank you. Any suggestions for um, what to prioritize among your tips? I realize your tips are already a priority, a prioritization among the many things people could be doing. Which it's a one is great the baby question, step? and you may have stumped us, Nina. Um, no one baby step? I think it's all about, in the end, it's collaborating with your community. Um, because this is this can feel, speaking personally, a little overwhelming to prepare for a policy that has such wide implications. And just knowing that you can rely on a community, can call on other people's expertise, I think is the most important step forward. Yeah, starting a discussion, everyone's needs is going to be a little bit different. So 
Um, there's not one solution for everyone. So figuring out what people need and starting from there to try and um, do the first steps is best.